There is a popular feature within ERA uh, that many folks are starting to utilize uh, that is quite powerful. And if you're not aware of it, it's accessible in the Earth Builder. So if we click on Earth Builder, uh, when we first pull up this particular example, what I've got is my rock properties displayed. And if I double click on this plot, it'll let me expand that we can see what we're looking at. We've got uh, on this deep water well, uh, pore pressure defined in black. We've got a collapse curve that's defined in yellow. And then my minimum horizontal stress, which is often taken as the, the, the losses gradient. Now, the, the way we're viewing this right now is these um, values we've obtained either from a geologist or a geomechanical specialist that has calculated these limits for us uh, for a specific well path. What it doesn't tell us is how these limitations would change if I were to alter my well path, different inclination, different azimuth. Uh, so what we've got now in ERA, if I click on rock properties, is rather than just defining those limits uh, on a TVD or MD basis um, as computed values that came from our, our geologist or um, geomechanical specialist, we can run the inputs, and you'll notice here input mode, it, rather than in EMW, which stands for equivalent mud weight, we can run it in mechanical earth model or MEM mode. And when I click on that dialog button, uh, it'll take a minute here for the system to compute because there's a lot of calculations happening. Uh, what we can do is compute what the um, pore pressure, collapse gradient, breakdown gradient, losses gradient will be for any inclination or azimuth in an area, if in, in a field. And there's a lot of squiggly lines on this graph. If we pull them up, we can see what each one of these are. Um, we've got pore pressure, as we did before. We've got three different definitions of collapse. So low risk collapse in green, medium risk collapse in yellow, and red uh, is high risk collapse. We'll, I'll talk about exactly what that means a little bit later on. And then we've got our minimum horizontal stress in gray. And off to the right, we can't quite see it unless we change the scale here. Uh, and black would represent our breakdown pressure. Now, breakdown pressure and collapse pressure are sensitive to inclination and azimuth. So those limits are driven directly off of whatever trajectory I've input into the path builder. So those values will change depending on your well path. How we come up with those limitations, if you come on down and uh, we'll use this little arrow here to expand our input screen. I've got a table of rock properties on a TVD basis uh, from the 13th Reeds casing shoe all the way to TD. And this came from a geomechanical specialist or a geologist. Uh, but the way they've defined um, the earth is, is different than what we're usually accustomed to. And what they've given us is uh, vertical stress or overburden. Uh, so this uh, right now is defined in, in a gradient in pounds per gallon, but it could also be defined in just pressure depending on what units or method your uh, geomechanics person is most comfortable with. But uh, vertical stress, minimum horizontal stress, maximum horizontal stress, the pore pressure. So these are kind of our, our stresses and pressures. And then we also need to know the unconfined compressive strength, the max direction of maximum horizontal stress. Right now, um, I'm just assuming that maximum stress is oriented north-south. So the azimuth here is zero degrees. PR stands for Poisson's ratio and FANG stands for friction angle. Now UCS, Poisson's ratio and friction angle can be derived from uh, core testing or more commonly from log analysis. So if we have acoustic logs in an area, the geomechanics folks can convert the acoustic information into an unconfined compressive strength, Poisson's ratio and friction angle. Um, the vertical stress, that overburden, typically comes from a density log. If you have a density log in an area, um, that can be integrated to come up with vertical stress. Minimum and maximum horizontal stress are a little bit more difficult to pin down. Uh, minimum stress can be determined if you have a leak-off test or you've done a mini-frack in, in a zone. Um, also, some more sophisticated acoustic logs, sonic logs, um, can back into this minimum and maximum horizontal stress. Maximum horizontal stress is the only one that we can't measure. It's probably the most difficult to get a handle on, but through some trial and error adjustment, we can uh, usually um, rule out what it isn't and, and try to gravitate towards what it most likely is. 
But when we've defined the Earth in this way, it opens up a great deal of possibility. And if I close this screen, uh, I'm going to grab the def depth reference line up here, this horizontal red line. When I drag it down and I put it on one of these layers of rock that's, uh, that's weak, uh, what I'll see over to the right are two plots. This is the mud weight required to, um, the, the mud, the limitation of the earth in a pounds per gallon or equivalent mud weight basis versus inclination. So as my inclination through that layer of rock increases, then my limits change. And you'll notice that green is low risk collapse, yellow is medium, red is high risk of collapse. Can't even see my pore pressure. I need to change my scale here. Change my scale to eight pound per gallon. You can see pore pressure down here, my three collapse curves, uh, and then of course I've got minimum horizontal stress and my breakdown pressure. So for that layer of rock, that's my sensitivity to inclination. For that same layer of rock, here's my sensitivity to azimuth. And the red uh, vertical line, uh, both in the azimuth plot and the inclination plot, represents what my trajectory is doing at that depth. At that measured depth, here's my inclination. It's about 79 degrees, and my azimuth is uh, almost 200 degrees. So that's where my particular trajectory lands. If I was to change the trajectory, then the location of that red vertical line would also change. As I move the depth reference line down, you'll notice that uh, those parameters alter slightly. Now, the other way that I can view this information uh, up at the top is if I click on the rows plot, that will pull up that traditional um, bullseye or polar plot that many people are familiar with looking at. And what we see now is azimuth on the outer perimeter of this graph and then each concentric ring represents increasing inclination. So a vertical well would be in the middle, 30 degree inclination well would be this ring, a 60 degree inclination well would be this ring, and then the outer circumference represents a 90 degree inclination penetration through this layer of rock. And then of course uh, the mud weight required to prevent collapse is this uh, heat scale, blue meaning low mud weight and red meaning high mud weight. And I can change what I'm viewing here with this drop down box. So this is the low risk collapse, collapse polar plot, but I could also look at medium risk, high risk, and uh, of course my breakdown pressure, all of which are sensitive to inclination and azimuth. So quite useful. If I double click on the plot, uh, I pull up here an engineering review, uh, engineering style report plot that they can be copied to my clipboard and pasted into a document if that's what I want to do with it. Um, some little details here. There are several different failure criteria that are used by the geomechanics community, uh, more Coulomb being kind of the, the standard or, or most common and most conservative. Uh, and that's not appropriate in this particular example that I'm showing. Uh, you'll notice when I recompute everything, the results of the more Coulomb uh, failure envelope means that this well is undrillable. And we actually did drill this well, so we know that more Coulomb is not appropriate for this particular example. Um, and then as you go down the list, each model is slightly less conservative. The Drucker, Prager, or Plasticity model is commonly used in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a Gulf of Mexico well. Uh, that's what we used here. Uh, the risk factor. So this drop-down box gives me two different options for defining what I'm, I'm calling my high, medium, and low risk of collapse. Breakout width. Uh, represents how wide the breakout uh, damage occurs on the side of the borehole wall. And then there's also what we call depth of damage. That is, how far does the damage extend into the borehole from the surface of the wall? Um, there's different camps or in the geomechanics community that um, gravitate towards one of these two methods. Both options are available to you. Um, by default, we tend to use depth of damage, but you can easily use breakout width if you prefer. Uh, tensile strength, this is how we calculate the uh, tensile strength of the rock. We use the UCS, the unconfined compressive strength, and assume that the tensile strength is, by default here, only 10% of the UCS. Now, for conservatism, a lot of people assume that rock has zero uh, tensile strength, and when I put in a zero tensile strength, what you'll notice is my breakdown gradient, this black curve, is going to move to the left because I'm not giving the rock any credit for its inherent tensile strength doesn't change anything else about our computation, just that breakdown gradient. The stability factor is a value that we can use to calibrate our model. Uh, it will increase the unconfined compressive strength if 
what we discover is the model is predicting collapse, but yet when we run a caliper log or if we've got an image log, we don't see any evidence of collapse. Well, one way to calibrate the model is through this stability factor. Decimation is just a way to clean up the plot so it doesn't have such uh, high intensity of squiggles. If we've been using a, a wireline log to compute our rock properties, if I had no decimation here, what you'll notice in a minute is this graph is almost unreadable um, because I've got sampling at every half foot increment. And just to make it a little bit more readable, to clean it up, give it something that's more presentable and understandable, we like to decimate. And what, the way I've got it set here is it's taking every 100 feet and using the 90% worst case value. That's what P sub X uh, means here. It's not using the absolute worst value in a 90 foot interval, but it's using the 90th percentile. So lots of squiggly lines there. A little bit easier to uh, understand or comprehend if we decimate. Now, one other thing about the uh, mechanical earth model or geomechanics model that's quite useful, if I close this and I go down to my, my sub-op level. So what I'm simulating here is tripping out of a 12 and a quarter inch hole. I've got my hook load. Uh, I'm not rotating right now, so there's no torque. But the ECD plot is what I want to draw your attention to. So I've got surge and swab loads. Let me just change this to run speed, sensitivity to run speed. What you're looking at is surge in blue and swab in red. And I've got my surface mud weight in green and my equivalent static density in pink. So blue represents equivalent, or sorry, uh, pink represents equivalent static density. Uh, and as you can see, the mud weight that I'm using and the ESD that results uh, is in the collapsed territory. I've got green, yellow, and, and red. Change my scale here a little bit so we can see this more easily. Uh, I am operating with a mud weight that is in the collapse zone. Um, there we go. Should be able to see that a little easier. Now, what is uh, quite powerful is to be able to quantify just the extent of the damage. And I can do that by clicking on Manage Data. And you'll notice when I click on Manage Data, there are two options here. There is Pseudo Caliper, which will compute what is the borehole size at any particular layer due to the lesser of either ESD or my swab load. And as you can see here, I'm going to have sections of the borehole that are enlarged to around 14 and a half inches. Uh, or another way of viewing it is a synthetic caliper. If I was, to, uh, sorry, synthetic image. If I was to run an image log in this well, this is what I would see on the image. And that would be uh, oriented bottom of the hole in the middle, top of the hole on the left and the right. The sides of the hole would be experiencing breakout. And I would see enlargement. It would look like somebody drove their four-wheeler or four-wheel drive truck down the middle of my log. Uh, that is indicative of breakout on the sides of the borehole. Uh, if I close this and widen it a bit, I'll show you what happens if we were to change our operational conditions. So on this well, it wouldn't be a great idea to pull out of the hole and swab the well down and create more damage. Uh, what I could do is uh, back remount. So if I put in a flow rate of 1,000 GPM, and I'm also going to put in a rotary speed, it's in right here. What you'll notice is uh, when I back ream out, the damage is not near as severe because uh, rather than the swab being the lowest pressure that the borehole feels, it's the equivalent static density that the borehole feels. So my damage now has been reduced to maybe 13, 13 and a half inches, and I don't have as near as much damage on the side of the borehole. Uh, better yet would be if I raise the mud weight. So if I bump up the mud weight to say 12 pound per gallon, now I've got, unfortunately, ECD that's right on the verge of my minimum horizontal stress. So I'm on the verge of losses. However, if I were to back ream out, there's almost no damage to the borehole and I retain nearly gauge hole. So this is quite valuable when we're trying to decide uh, our operational conditions, whether to pump out, back ream out, pull out, how fast to pull out, what mud weight to use. Um, very helpful in quantifying just the extent of damage that would occur to our hole. So hope you find that useful.